Welcome to our presentation, Vital Signs in Cleaning Equipment today. We will be discussing how to keep our equipment maintained, disinfected, accurate, and in good working order. The objectives that we will be discussing are understanding the importance and reason for vital signs, knowing what is needed to complete vital signs, and where the equipment is kept the importance of keeping the equipment maintained and disinfected to prevent infections, know the accuracy of using digital finger, wrist, blood pressure monitors, or and identify more vital signs and why they should be reported. Identify areas for documentation. We have reasons for vital signs. What we do with the vital signs is we understand how the body is working. In other words, is the heart beating like it should be? Does someone have an infection? So the well-being of patients, this is very important. By understanding vitals a little bit more, we know that um, we can understand whether the heart is working properly, if there's any problems with the lungs. And we also know that numbers fluctuate at times, and this may be uh, not only because of illness or infections, but it can also be anxiety and stress and other things that cause these changes in people's blood pressures. When should patients have their vitals taken? Well, it depends. Physicians order blood pressure and pulse when patients are taking blood pressure or heart medications. When a person is admitted to the facility, once weekly when patients are stable, when a patient complains of not feeling well, when we notice change in the level of consciousness, confusion, flushed, unsteady, lethargic, etc. Be proactive in your work environment. When you observe a change in the patient, ask if you may get their vitals and then report any fluctuations or abdominal readings to your nurse. The equipment that you will need is a sphygmal manometer or a blood pressure cuff. These are manual blood pressure cuffs that we use on the halls. They are more accurate than the electronic monitors and we don't use the monitors at all, I don't think anymore. A stethoscope, a thermometer, uh, we use the tympanic ear thermometers, an O2SAT monitor, and a watch with a second hand, or we can use a clock with a second hand. All equipment we use should be cleaned and disinfected between clients. The equipment the clients use should be cleaned daily. If we have clients in wheelchairs, recliners, walkers, etc., do you know how to clean them? What is used to keep the bacteria at bay? Cleaning this equipment is our responsibility. It is the same as if a person sees a spill on the floor. The person who sees it should clean it. Usually staff at night take the equipment to the shower room and clean whatever the clients are using so that they can be ready in the morning for service. Disinfectant, brush, warm or hot water, and rags are used to clean the equipment. However, staff on another shift can clean up the equipment if it gets dirty at a meal or at some other time. Please don't misunderstand me. I know everyone works hard, but at the same time, we have to provide a clean environment for our patients, and if we don't, the client is the one to pay because of becoming sick. In the long run, that costs more time than keeping him or her clean. So when you find that you have moments that you don't have anything to do, and I know that doesn't happen very often, if you do see a recliner that needs to be cleaned, someone needs to take it into the shower room and scrub it down and get it ready for that patient. 
Now we're going to talk a little bit about cleaning blood pressure cuffs and I have a video for you to watch to see how we do it properly and we'll have some further tips on the disinfectants and what we use later on. To revamp, we're going to go over this a little bit more. So to clean a blood pressure cuff, put on gloves, nitrile or powder free. Examine the entire cuff for stains or bodily fluids. Remove the tubing from the cuff. No water should enter into the tubing. Make sure inflation bag is dry before putting the tubing back on. If tubing cannot be removed, follow the manufacturer's instructions. Soap cuff, if it cannot be washed right away, use a bucket with warm soapy water, use a soapy brush or sponge under warm water. You can use a rag or paper towel if in a pinch. Do not soak tubing. Put it in a sterile bag until you can disinfect it. Scrub both sides of this cuff, tubing, and bulb, making sure not to get any water in the tubing. Vigorously scour the Velcro particularly because it holds a lot of bacteria and other things in the, in the Velcro itself. Rinse the cuff and tubing in warm water, making sure not to get any water in the tubing. Spray alcohol or disinfectant on the cuff tubing and bulb. Let set for 10 minutes before drying with a towel. Allow the cuff and tubing to air dry before use. The outer and inner cuff as well as the Velcro should be completely dry before use. Once dry, you can reinsert the tubing. If you don't have time to wash before using blood pressure cuff on another patient, you can spray with alcohol or hospital disinfectant Allow 10 minutes to completely dry. Blood pressure cuffs are considered not critical. This means that they are used on intact skin so are less likely to cause an infection as there is not an open wound.
Now next, we're going to see how to use and clean a stethoscope. And then we'll discuss more after the video. Couples remembering that you can, like I said, you can always go to the store and buy one of these to kind of just kind of a quick um, tip to help you. Um, you can see this on the right side. I think there's some tube in your ears. Okay, now moving on to the bell. There's two ways that these bells can be um, put into. For example, this would be closed. And 
So let's talk a little bit about cleaning the stethoscope. She did a very good job on telling you how to use the stethoscope. Most stethoscopes uh, tubing is made of PB PVC. To best clean your tubing, warm soapy water and a rag or paper towel is recommended. 
Soak your paper towel or bag in soapy water and wipe down. After wiping down your tubing, use another paper towel or bag to dry. If harsher cleaning solutions such as rubbing alcohol is continuously used on PVC, it can cause the tubing to become sticky. So you don't want to use alcohol or even our wipes because they're mostly alcohol too. And this is a good way to protect the PVC. However, it can be used on the other parts, the diagram, uh, diaphragm, uh, the uh, earpieces, and the belt. The chest piece and diaphragm arguably require the most frequent cleaning. To clean your chest piece, use a 70% isopropyl rubbing alcohol soaked cotton ball or 70% rubbing alcohol prep pads and wipe the entire chest piece. Keep the chest piece visibly wet for at least 10 seconds before drying it. To reach the harder to reach areas, such as around the stem, use a cotton swab soaked in rubbing alcohol. The headset can be cleaned using a cotton ball soaked in rubbing alcohol or alcohol wipes. Place the headset in between the prep pads or cotton balls soaked in rubbing alcohol and swipe upwards and dry if necessary. Try not to get any of the liquid into the earpieces themselves. You want to keep the alcohol on the outside. Ear tips can get dirty quickly. Sometimes it's hard to tell when your tips need a quick cleaning. Getting clear ear tips can help with that. An easy way to clean inside the crevices of your ear tip is to use a cotton swab soaked in rubbing alcohol. To clean underneath the ear tips, uh, the ear tips are removable and can be popped off. Okay, next we're going to clean and use a tympanic thermometer. And we again will discuss this a little bit after you've finished watching this video.
your thermometer. Clean the probe in the tip with an alcohol swab or an ear swab dipped in isopropyl alcohol after each measurement. This will ensure the most accurate reading. To clean the body of the ear thermometer, you may use a soft, dry cloth. Do not use abrasive cleaning agents, thinners, or benzene for, clean, for cleaning. So each thermometer, each time you use it, you have a little plastic uh, cover that goes on the probe. And when you use that, then you throw it away because it's disposable. And then you clean the earpiece with isopropyl alcohol. Now we're going to learn how to clean and use an O2 monitor. Before cleaning, make sure to turn off the oximeter. You should always make sure that equipment that's battery operated or plugged into electrical outlets is turned off before you clean them. Using a soft dry cloth or alcohol wipes, clean the exposed areas of the oximeter LED lights. Next, clean the inside of the elastic th <coughs> Excuse me. Thimble, making sure there is no dirt or blood. When cleaning the SPO2 sensors, using the same method of cleaning using a soft dry cloth or alcohol wipes, make sure to let the sensory dry before you use again. When the battery indicator indicates that the battery is low, we need to replace the batteries at that time. Keep your pulse oxi oximeter in a dry environment. A moist environment can damage the oximeter, rendering it useless. And remember, there are things that can affect a pulse oximeter reading. Nail varnish or bright lights. Uh, movement also, so you wanna make sure that your patient is still when you're using the pulse ox. Another thing that we have found is when a person's O2 sat is around 88%, we've heard um, nurses or nursing CNAs tell the person to take a deep breath. When you're getting an oximeter reading, you're getting the oxygen that the person is, has available in their body. So asking them to take a deep breath only makes the monitor go up, but it doesn't change their breathing pattern. So when you walk away, that person will go back into that breathing pattern and whatever oxygen level they were in is what they'll be in. So there are times when oxygen needs to be um, applied to the patient because their O2 level is low. Now we have disposable germicidal surface wipes. Some people believe that these wipes are um, Clorox wipes. And I want you to know what I found out through my research is that any of these wipes that you believe have are Clorox wipes are not. They are alcohol.
If you look on the disposable germicidal surface wipes, you will find that they have alcohol, which is 60% alcohol, and they also have isopropanol, which is 70, 70, Seventy-eight point six nine two percent, and so these wipes that we're using on the glucometer are the same wipes that we can use on the vitals equipment, or we can use the alcohol prep pads. Like I said, on the tubing, it's probably not a good idea if the tubing is PVC to use alcohol. So soap and warm water will clean just as well. But when you're using the um, bell of the stethoscope and the earpieces or any of the other equipment, you do need to use alcohol. And it does need to set for the required time to be disinfected. And then if there is anything left, you can wipe it off with a dry paper towel or a soft cloth. Normally, alcohol dries quickly, and that's why they prefer alcohol. It, dry, it goes into the air. It doesn't stay on anything for very long. And this is what we use to clean our instruments. Remember that we do need to clean our instruments in between patients. Where will we find the equipment? Well, there should be a place in the aid stations where it's marked that this is where we have our vitals equipment. A plastic container usually is what we use. Uh, we also have vital signs or blood pressure cuffs with the PPE equipment and the emergency cards. So when you have an emergency, it should be readily available to you to get uh, blood pressure cuffs, stethoscopes, and monitors, all of this uh, at the scene so that you can gather data quickly. They also have this equipment at the clinic. So when the clinic has an emergency, then people have the ability to uh, take vitals. The equipment should be marked and checked regularly for availability and service. Batteries run down and need replaced. Making sure batteries are available is most important. Always clean equipment before using on a patient. We are all responsible for maintenance on the equipment, so no one in particular uh, is in charge of this. We all need to be looking at it and making sure that it's in good working order. And if it's not, then you need to report that you have a problem with one of the pieces of equipment. Equipment maintenance, why do we do that? Well, we do that because accuracy is very important. We don't want to use false data. Um, false data would be similar to, let's say you went down and you got Joe's blood pressure and his pulse and you didn't have anything to write it down on. So on your way back to the nurse's station to write it down, someone talked to you and threw numbers at you and you forgot that you were trying to remember what his vitals were and you got to the nurse's station and you couldn't remember for sure. If you can't remember, then you need to go back and take them again. This is false data if you think this is what it said. Also to avoid spreading infections. This is why we clean our equipment. We do not want to uh, have hospital acquired infections going back and forth around the hospital. The cleaner we keep things, the better off we are. I do know that some germs are helpful, you know, because people need to build up immunities and we don't want to make super bugs. However, we do want to make sure that we're not spreading infections from one patient to another. And then maintaining and cleaning equipment. 
Uh, this is everyone's responsibility. We should be washing our hands in between patients. So when you take vitals, you clean the equipment, you wash your hands, and then you start all over again. Use on stethoscopes, use alcohol swabs to clean off the earpieces and diaphragm, remove gloves and wash hands. Do not cross-contaminate. Use different placement of alcohol pad each time it's placed on the stethoscope. So you don't clean the same area with the same alcohol uh, place that you used. And this may be why the wipes are better. They, and there's more area and you can actually uh, prevent people from getting uh, sick by cross-contamination. For infection control purposes, we have discussed cleaning vitals equipment, disinfecting the blood pressure cuff, using gloves, spray disinfectant on clean rag, then wipe down the blood pressure cuff. This should be done between patients. Take off gloves and wash hands. For the tympanic gear or forehead monitor, wipe, wipe area used on the client with an alcohol pad. Use friction to remove dirt, grime, blood, and pathogens. Wash hands after removing gloves and allow monitor to air dry before using again. One thing I want to remind you when you're using these cleaning agents, uh, even if you're using the McKesson, McKesson, you need to be wearing gloves so that you're not getting this into your skin. It also dries out your skin very badly. The pulse oximeter, O2 sap monitor, wipe out inside finger area with alcohol swab using gloves, remove gloves, wash hands, and allow monitor to dry before using them again. Uh, digital monitors, what are the pros and cons? of using digital monitors. Well, the pros are they are automatic, they're easier to read, there's no stethoscope, and you get the readout that tells you exactly what it is. The con is people weren't using them properly, so we have people who are moving. Uh, we couldn't tell if a person had an irregular heartbeat because we weren't listening. Obesity causes a problem because it doesn't fit, and then cuff fit and accuracy. So we are using blood pressure cuffs and stethoscopes because they are more accurate than electronic monitors. When we use manual equipment, we get more information than with electronic monitors. We are also able to distinguish pulse, irregularities, skip beats, rate, shortness of breath, etc. So this is why we have gone back to using the manual cuffs. The averages for blood pressure for an adult is 90 over 60 to 120 over 80. Anything below that is low blood pressure or hypertension. Anything above 120 over 80 is considered hypertension. Reported normal blood pressure readings. For an example, if you had a blood pressure that was 80 over 50 or 90 over 52, these are low blood pressures. And the REN needs to make an assessment to determine what is happening here. It's just like if you get a blood pressure that's 140 over 110, that's a high blood pressure. That is abnormal. That needs to be reported to your nurse. On pulses, the adult male runs about 72. It also depends on how healthy people are. People in good health, they may have a slower heartbeat, it may be around 60. Adult females, 76 to 80. Elderly, 50 to 65, because as people get older, their heart has been used for many, many years. It's never stopped beating. And so it slows down over a period of time. Children about 90, newborns are up to 140. Report heart rate below 60 or above 120 on adults. Report blood pressure 140 over 90 
or 220 over 110. As a CNA taking vitals of the client on a regular basis, you should know when the vitals are not in the regular baseline reading for that client. It is important to get this abnormal reading to your nurse because the client's physical condition can change quickly. So reporting is uh, very, very important. And you don't have to wait until someone tells you to go get the vitals before you uh, take vitals. Like I said, if somebody is complaining and not feeling well, ask them if you can take their vitals. If they say yes, then go ahead and get them from your nurse. If they say no, not right now, then go ahead and tell your nurse that the patient um, is, not, is complaining of not feeling well but wouldn't allow me to get their vitals. A temperature 97.8 to 99.1 Fahrenheit is normal. Average is 98.6 or 37.0 Celsius. You need to report anything over 101. The reason that temperatures are normal, 97.8 to 99.1, is every one of us has a different temperature. Some of us run cooler than others. And so therefore, um, and some people run hotter. So that, that gives us a little bit of a uh, variance. But if it is 101, this person is, uh, does have an infection. Respirations, 12 to 18 breaths per minute. Report 12, below 12 or over 24. An O2 saturation, report 89% on room air. Don't ask patients to take deep breaths. Abnormalities include temperatures, respirations, and O2 sats as well. Low temperatures are as life-threatening as high temperatures. This lets the nurse know something is wrong. Never be upset if the nurse retakes the vitals. She will be the one who contacts the doctor and she is supporting your accuracy as well when she arrives at the same numbers you report. This is a team working together, being consistent. When the nurse sees the CNA in this light, he or she knows the CNA is reliable and is going to listen to this person every time they say something. Documentation, if you don't document it, it didn't happen. It's like when I was younger and I was an LPN and I was working in a nursing home and I was uh, making sure on the evening shift that all of my patients had a bowel movement every three days. If somebody didn't document that a person had a bowel movement, then I gave them milk of mag and prune juice. The reason for this was to make sure that my patients didn't get an impaction or constipation. And this worked very well because people can die from impactions and we have had patients die. So when you get data, you need to make sure that you're putting it down. Make sure all the information is documented on the graphic sheets in the avatar or the Mars. Now you may not be using graphic sheets now, but I do know that at one time on Uinta, especially um, we would be carbon now we were we had graphic sheets and we would get the vials and put them on the graphic sheets so if you're not using them that's fine but they do need to go into the avatar and the mars it is true if the information is documented it didn't happen many times the work cnas do is not recorded so when an incident happens it becomes a serious problem and it is brought to light. For instance, John has an open area on his coccyx. The nurse just happens to notice it when she helps the CNA take him to the bathroom. Nothing has been documented. John has been repositioned every two hours and no one has said anything to the nurse. The nurse assesses John's coccyx area, starts treatment, 
and initiates the repositioning every two hours. The situation might have been prevented if the CNA had documented and reported this injury to let the nurse know the patient turns back over to his back every time we put him on his side. Practice good documentation and communication. We are all accountable for our actions, so let, let us be proactive and an important member of the team. Sometimes people get sores because they aren't necessarily compliant with what we're trying to do for them. And that's why I'm saying that it needs to be documented that you turn this person and then he turned back over on his back. And this is why he ended up with a sword. Are there any questions? We do have a test that you will need to take after viewing this. And um, we will make sure that you um, that it's all on here and we will grade the test for you to make sure that you passed. And so I thank everyone for coming. I appreciate the time that you spent watching this and I hope it helps. If you do have any questions or you want to talk to me about something, don't hesitate to call me. My phone number uh, extension is 346 or you can send me an email and I will get back with you. Thank you very much.